August the 8th, 2020. As you're looking at the almost quiet Atlantic Ocean from satellite images from today, you can see it's getting dark, switching over into infrared. And this morning, if you look over off the African coast, I noticed this storm was large and it has started to rotate. And so I was wondering uh, if they were going to start watching it. And in the late report, now they have, and I think they've given it about a 20% chance of development. But again, right here, wrapping up off the African coast south of the uh, Cabo Verde Islands. And what they're saying, again, this is a five-day forecast from the National Hurricane Center, is you, we have a 20% chance of cyclone formation in five days. We're going to keep an eye on it, guys. Um, it's uh, large enough that we need to. There was a smaller system that drifted closer to the Caribbean that finally just uh, was knocked out. This system seems to be a little larger and a little uh, better organized. It says the shower and thunderstorms located a few hundred miles south of the Cabo Verde Islands are associated with a westward-moving tropical wave. Some slow development of the system is possible over the next few days as it crosses uh, the tropical eastern Atlantic. By the middle of the next week, environmental conditions are expected to become less favorable for development. The same thing happened with Isaias, and uh, it made it through there, and then it finally got into the warmer waters near the uh, Bahamas, and this thing fired up, and there's still um, several hundred thousand people without power, if not close to a million up in the uh, northeast, guys, from just, uh, again, Cat 1 Isaiah's. But it came in so full of moisture and flooding and high winds. Were, they were getting gusts just at ground level, not up in the mountains where you were getting 130, 140 knot uh, gusts, but 90 miles an hour, 100 mile an hour gust at the surface. And it did a lot of damage, a lot of flooding, a lot of power outages. So we'll keep an eye on this. I wanted to mention it. But the um, main video, main reason I'm doing the video is the sun is changing into solar cycle 25. And I want to take a look at that. Now, these are images from the Solar Dynamics Observatory called the SDO. And all of these links are on our website at bpearthwatch.com. But the SDO is a space-based satellite with uh, multiple cameras, different filters, and it's between us and the sun. Uh, it moves, but it's between us and the sun, and it gives us an earth-facing perspective of what might be uh, coming at us. And what we're seeing now is activity finally coming back uh, into solar cycle 25. We've seen a few small sunspots, nothing very uh, big or anything, but you've got three lined up now that are earth-facing. Uh, the two in the center would be the ones probably to watch because of the way they're concentrated. But the newest one right here, guys, uh, emitted the strongest solar flare so far of the year, of the beginning of the solar cycle, as a matter of fact. It was just a C flare, but it's been emitting, uh, emitting B-class flares. You go to C, then M, then your X flares. But this is a beginning of a new solar cycle, and the C class flare that you see right there watch for that signature flare as it comes back around happened this morning earlier coming up watch for it right here bam right there you see that blast that's called a sea flare and it ionizes the upper atmosphere of our planet um, ham radio operators and other people other navigational uh, systems were affected by it, different frequencies. But it's nothing to compare to what we were seeing during the solar cycle peak of the of 24 that we just came out of a few years ago here on this channel. And so as it begins, it's not going to peak as high as cycle 24 was because uh, we're going into grand solar minimum. Each one of these cycles will become less until we pull back out of that, but we will have the oscillation of the 11 point years going from no solar activity like we've been seeing to extensive solar activity. So this is the time to start watching it. But again, uh, we've had our first C class fa flare of this solar cycle. If you look at space weather, another link on our site, guys, they're showing a couple of clips from the event right here. We were just watching on the same camera. But it's saying a new solar 
uh, a new cycle solar flare August 8th began with a bang. At 3.49 Universal Time, the magnetic canopy of new cycle sunspot AR-2770 erupted, producing a C1-class solar flare. NASA Solar Dynamics Observatory captured the explosion's extreme ultraviolet flash. Guys, do you know that it takes about eight minutes for the initial energy of a solar flare to get to our planet? That's all, about eight minutes. And so um, that's why you have that rapid ionization of the atmosphere. Radiation from the flare ionized Earth's upper atmosphere briefly, disturbing shortwave radio propagation across the western Pacific Ocean. That was the sun-facing side at that time. Mariners and amateur radio operators may have noticed the effects which were confined to frequencies below 10 MHz. The flare did not hurl a CME toward Earth, so no geomag geomagnetic storms are expected to result from the blast. AR-27... Uh, 70 will be facing Earth more or less for the next week. I want to point out something about this. Now, this is a high filter uh, image here, and it's, that sunspot is big enough to where it's being picked up on. It's larger than the first one, and the second area here is not really a sunspot. It's just an area of activity, and you can see it in the surface. But here, 2770, let me show you something. Well, let's kind of draw a line through the equator of the sun right about there now the earth is slightly below that ecliptic we're down in this area on the average so if we're we're not really in the ecliptic if you see sunspots closer to the uh, equator of the sun and below that they're more earth facing but this one is and what happens is guys there's um an effect called the uh earth sun's magnetic connectivity point and it's a plasma tube that runs from the surface of the sun to all of the planets. And ours uh, the, in, uh, is, comes from the sun to the earth. And the tube itself is as wide as our planet. But it, And you, you can see as we look at that graph of the size that it appears on the sun. But all the planets are attached to the sun. And when things happen, there's a massive transfer of energy through that plasma tube. Now, when these sunspots... They're moving this way as the sun rotates. And uh, we'll look at the Earth's magnetic uh, connectivity point now, as well as Mars and, and, and uh, Mercury and Venus. But as they, these uh, sunspots move in this direction, and right now our Earth's connectivity point is right in this area because it's, it waves like a tornado, guys, as the bending of the plasma tube has that motion. But what we've seen over the last several years is that one of these sunspots or magnetic fil filament to, uh, that can release a prominence or a coronal mass ejection as it gets to the Earth's magnetic connectivity point. It seems to be an energy transfer, and I've seen it many times, that a flare occur at that point. Let's take a look at that chart and where the uh, connectivity point is today. Now, what you're looking at is the current connectivity points of the different planets. On the, of, uh... Now, this chart is from yesterday, and everything's rotating to the right. But what you're looking at, if you notice at the top, Magnetic Connectivity Solar Scape Viewer. And this one connect, shows you the connection points through this plasma tube of uh, the different planets and the sun, which that's what controls our weather. And what you're seeing here is Earth is in the blue. Guys, let me uh, pull this up where we can kind of pull this in here. But right here in this chart, in the blue, is Earth. That's what I was talking about, is these sunspots rotate from the left of your image to the right with the sun. And as they hit the Earth's connectivity point, or the other planets, but when it's the Earth's connectivity point, then energy travels through that plasma tube. And it, it's a, like, again, a large, waving, tornado-like vortex of plasma energy. Now, here you've got in the silver is Mercury. Venus is, would be in the yellow if it was visible, and I think it's right up here in this area. But you see what I'm saying? We have a plasma connectivity point. Now, what they're saying, notification... Earth 
through the gong WSA in Lil. They know how to name these things, don't they? It's 2.6 degrees from an active region. And this is not a sunspot. It's actually called a plaque, and, and but it's a disturbed area with different magnetic polarities. The yellow and the green indicate that, as, w as well as you see here on sunspot 1277. Green on this side and yellow on this side. That indicates the new solar cycle because the sun's magnetic poles change every 11.8 years not like the earth it takes millions of years sometimes but um so that has changed and we're going to have to be watching this when these things flare up or we have an opening in the uh, coronal hole in the sun with increased solar wind speed it always affects these storms in the atlantic but it, we'll watch this, guys, but this is just kind of a basic lesson. We're not into any major solar problems yet. This is just, a um, again, an example of what's about to happen as we get into Solar Cycle 25 full-fledged. And, guys, I tracked the x flare that left the surface of the sun as the Earth turned facing it in the Pacific. And Tokyo time that afternoon, that solar flare hit the Earth. It compressed everything. We had a earthquake there, the Fukushima earthquake, a 9.0. And it caused the worst uh, disaster in the planet history as far as man-made disasters still leaking into the Pacific Ocean. But it tr we tracked it. And that's what the problem is when you get into these areas of uh, increased solar cycle activity. But guys, we're just watching it. Um, let me say this before I end this video. I'm getting a lot of questions here and there from um, about what kind of solar situation do I need it for a camper for or um, a small um, cabin or stuff like that. And I'm going to be working on that. There's a lot of information available, you know, and I've been talking about I've been building mine and getting it ready, and I'll show you some of that. But there's a lot of questions, but it's becoming increasingly uh, affordable in the last few years and more and more important. Unlike a gas generator where you may not can get fuel, as long as the sun's shining, you can get it with these solar generators, and you can build your own solar system that's not just a small generator, but can power large sections of your home, even up to your entire home. It gets expensive at that point, but you just have to weigh that in with uh, your plans. The uh, As long as the sun shines, you've got power if you've got the right system. If the sun's not shining, uh, for a prolonged period of time, you don't have to worry about it anyway, guys, because uh, nothing else will matter. But uh, we're watching it, and I I'll get on some of those questions and try to do a video to answer them as clearly as I can. But again, we're watching the Atlantic. We're watching the sun. It's a heads up, guys. Be safe.